is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Welcome to Global Business Europe, live from CGTN in London. I'm Jamie Owen. And I'm Robin Dwyer. Our top stories. Political leaders from across the world join China's President Xi Jinping as he marks a century of the country's governing party. Our other headlines, Britain's biggest microchip factory is sold to the Chinese-owned company Nexperia, despite security concerns. Shares in the ride-hailing app Didi fall on U.S. markets as Chinese regulators crack down on big tech. COVID could rise to 100,000 cases a day as the U.K. government outlines loosening restrictions. Plus... And when is champagne not champagne? The diplomatic spat that's got Russia and France all shaken up. It's one of the biggest gatherings of political leaders in the world. More than 500 leaders of political organizations and parties have taken part in the summit with the Communist Party of China to mark its centenary. Chinese President Xi Jinping, General Secretary of the CPC Central Committee, called for win-win cooperation. Wu Guozhu reports from the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. A virtual gathering of the Communist Party of China and its global friends. Chinese President Xi Jinping spoke from the Golden Hall of the Great Hall of People. Today, human society is once again at a historic crossroads. Hostile confrontation or mutual respect, isolationism or openness, decoupling or cooperation, zero-sum games or mutual benefit. The choice is in our hands, and the responsibility falls on our shoulders. Facing challenges brought by changes and seen in a century and the global COVID-19 pandemic, President Xi called for political parties to better shoulder their responsibilities through mutual learning. 21 guest speakers, most of them leaders of ruling parties and heads of government, also expressed their thoughts. Through measures like the Belt and Road Initiative and extensive skills development, China continues to support economic reform, instructive development, enhanced trade and greater integration amongst African economies. The summit was attended by parties and political organizations from over 160 countries. More than 100 sub-venues have been set up across the world. These hundreds of political party flags come in different colors and designs and remind us that whatever difference our values are, we can always sit down and talk. That's also what the CPC says it hopes to achieve, a new type of party-to-party -party relationship that seeks to expand common ground while reserving differences and enhancing mutual respect and learning. Wu Guoxiu, CGTN, Beijing. The Chinese Premier Li Keqiang said China hopes to promote a healthy relationship with Britain during a conference with British business leaders. Li said China will continue to open its market to foreign investors, adding that he hopes the UK can provide a fair environment for Chinese companies. On the pandemic, Li says China is willing to increase cooperation with Britain on COVID research. Britain's biggest microchip company has been sold to a Chinese company despite security concerns. The Chinese semiconductor company Nexperia has bought one of the UK's biggest chipmakers, Newport Wafer Fab. The deal has raised eyebrows, with critics saying the British company shouldn't be sold when there's a global shortage of chips. The UK manager for Nexperia told me the company's happy to answer any questions from the British government. Nexperia was already a customer uh, for the foundry services of, uh, of Newport Wafer Fab, um, uh, and we became also the largest shareholder in 2019. And, and we see Newport as the ideal partner, as it has a proven track record in, uh, in, in semiconductor and especially power semiconductor production. Um, and yeah, with the growth plans and the ambitions that Syria has, Newport uh, simply fitted very well into that. And you already have some other European operations. Is this a key market yeah. for you? 
we have also operations in uh, in Hamburg and in uh, and in Manchester in England. And uh, this wafer fab is complementary to that. We can do things in this wafer fab we cannot do in the other ones. How are you planning to overcome some existing opposition within the UK government to this acquisition? We've seen similar deals coming under the microscope from regulators. Mm -hmm. um, well, we've been in very constructive conversation with all stakeholders around Newport, Newport Wafer Fab when we were going into this deal. And that included also the local Welsh government. And we really want to uh, keep these constructive relations. And if there is any questions from the UK government, we're more than ready to answer those. There's been a global chip shortage. To what mm -hmm. extent will this deal help tackle that? Um, well, it will definitely help tackling it, as Nexperia will invest significantly into Newport in expanding its capacity and uh, in that way, uh, yeah, contributing to, to tackling the global chip shortage. And when do you think we might see an end to it? Um, that's a very good question. And, and if I would knew that, I would, uh, I'm not sure I would tell you actually. Uh, no, on a serious note, it's, uh, it, it's very difficult to say. Uh, I think we, we know the semiconductor market is cyclical and uh, both headwinds and tailwinds, they are very difficult to predict. Um, at the same time, if I look to the conversations that I'm having with, uh, with my partners in the value chain, both customers and suppliers, um, they all see an ongoing uh, strong demand. So um, we see this market uh, ongoing for a while. Will this be a chance for the company to investigate some new chip technology? Um, Nexperia, we're always looking into all kinds of uh, new chip technologies, not specifically related to, uh, to Newport Wafer Fab, but that is in, uh, in general on our radar screen, as we are an innovative company and, and with that also come uh, yeah, looking for, for new technologies. Shares in the Chinese ride-hailing giant Didi have opened down around a quarter on its float price just days after the firm's launch on the New York markets. This comes amid a wider sell-off in the tech sector, with regulators in China hinting at a crackdown on cybersecurity issues. Live now to New York and our correspondent John Terrett. John, let's start with Didi first. Uh, stock down a quarter in pre-market yep. training, but uh, uh, just how much further yeah. could it fall? Well, Didi is fairly confident about things, actually, which I'll get to in just a second. All I can tell you is that the market opened here at 9.30 this morning, and DD shares were down about 24%, wiping around $18 billion off the value of the company. And here in New York, I think people are irritated by this. I think I said to you on Friday and yesterday as well on the program when we did the story, people are saying, well, you know, you couldn't have mentioned all of this before we started buying shares last Wednesday. But also they have realized that it's a risk, you know, when you invest in companies domestically here in America. It's a big risk and if you're investing in companies that are overseas in other jurisdictions then really it's an even bigger risk and I did tell you last Wednesday and again on yesterday's program the biggest Achilles heel that DD faces is regulations and the regulators it operates in so many areas around the world and any of them could turn on DD which is after all really a technology company it's not we think of it as a ride hailing company we think of it as about transportation but really it's a technology company and technology is very much in the sights of jurisdictions around the world now I don't think we expected it to happen in the home market quite as quickly as it has but it's also worth pointing out that China of course is simply not alone when it comes to looking into these kind of cyber security and other kind of sort of antitrust issues we've seen it in Europe we see it here in the United States as well now Didi this is my point from earlier Didi said look we didn't know and we also think that our revenue stream may not be as badly affected as was at first thought. And the reason for that is we are a global company. They say, you know, we were born in China, but we want to be a global company. And they kind of already are. They're in Japan and Australia. They're all over Latin America. They're in Russia. I'm sure other jurisdictions as well. And, of course, the home market. But now what has happened is that the investigation has been launched over the weekend. The app was withdrawn domestically at home in China. And so today, U.S. traders have had their first chance to react to that bit of the story. And I don't know of how much interest this is to anybody around the world, but they priced themselves at $14. They started at $16.65. They closed the first day down 
because of this very issue at $14.14. On Friday, when news of the probe came out, they fell immediately by 7%, but closed down 5%. And now they opened this morning down 24%. They're presently down 20% at $12.39. So it's pretty much bang on a quarter off the value of the stock when it first traded on Wednesday last. Let's turn to another big story, this uh, cyber attack on the uh, U.S. software giant uh, yes. Casair and what it meant for uh, the firm's many, many clients. I know. Well, I had to check the pronunciation. I, did, I thought it was Casair. It turns out to be, I think it is Casair. Uh, they're based in Miami, of course, in the south of the country, and they are a software and IT management company. Well, I mean, that doesn't really mean very much to most people, does it? I mean, what do they do? I don't really know. What they sort of do is manage other people's IT and software for them. So they're headquartered in Miami, and they've got clients all over the world, and then they basically manage their systems as they go. Now, according to Casea, between 50 and 60 of their customers, their direct customers, were affected by this hack, which affected them. And then they think somewhere between 800 and 1,500 companies down the line, as it were, downstream, as it were, have been, or potentially have been affected. So in a way, think of it as the virus or the hack, sort of piggybacking off each little company and going down. Now, these are all small businesses. They're not big businesses. They can't really afford to pay a massive ransom. One example I have for you is a supermarket in Sweden, which was one of their customers, apparently, which certainly can't afford to pay anything. There are lots of restaurants and very small businesses that they work for. The thing is, you see, this is the first day back of work in America after the long Fourth of July holiday. So I think we could find more companies revealing, if they choose to, a lot of companies choose not to reveal this stuff, but if they choose to, revealing what's been happening to them over the weekend. The FBI is probing, of course. The White House says, look, if you think you've been hacked, get in touch with us as quickly as possible. Mr. Biden says he's not sure if it's Russia or not, but almost every expert thinks it is our evil. There's, they may not be in Russia, but they're kind of Russian-associated says there's no threat to U.S. infrastructure. But here's the thing. They're demanding $70 million. That's a huge ransom, much more than we've seen, more than Colonial Pipeline paid and the big meatpacking company, JBS, more than they allegedly paid. Will they pay a ransom? Well, the Kaseya CEO is being pretty tight-lipped because it's very embarrassing, obviously, to be hacked. So he's being tight-lipped about it. He's kind of saying no comment, but he has hinted that they won't pay a ransom. But, of course, we're just going to have to sit back and watch this unfold and see whether they do end up paying a ransom and what happens next. Jamie and Robin. John, quick final word on oil and oil prices. Uh, that OPEC Plus meeting yes. Uh, yes. seems to have ended in, uh, in disarray. So I wonder what that means for yeah. oil prices for all of us. Well, very quickly here, I mean, oil has been spiking after that OPEC meeting ended essentially in failure with the members rowing. Questions now over the very future of OPEC as an entity. Of course, people have been questioning that one for many, many years. 47 million Americans traveled over the weekend, 2,160,000 of them by aircraft, somewhere around 43, 44 million in cars, apparently, despite gas prices here at a record high, six, seven month high for gas prices. Now, some people here blame Joe Biden for some of his policies. He canceled the Keystone Pipeline, which was a major artery for oil from the shale fields. Canada down to the Gulf of Mexico. That's been cancelled. The Green New Deal, of course, is hovering out there, yet to come into the Congress, but it's the whole policy of the Biden administration is anti-fossil fuel, the complete opposite of what the Trump administration was. Of course, all of this means that energy stocks have been doing very well lately. As these prices go up for one reason or another, then uh, energy stocks benefit from that. Uh, oil was spiking over the weekend. It's actually coming down a bit now. John Terrace in New York. Thank you very much. Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam has dismissed warnings from major U.S. tech firms that they will leave the city if a new privacy law is passed. City officials say the new law will target so-called doxing, the act of maliciously publishing someone's personal details online. Analysts say firms like Facebook and Google are worried they could be held liable if the law is approved. Shares in the Chinese retailer Suning jumped 10% in Shenzhen after the company secured a bailout worth more than $1 billion. The deal is backed by local government suppliers and the Chinese commerce giant Alibaba. This agreement means the billionaire founder of Suning, Zhang Xingdong, will no longer run this company.
The future of one of Britain's major car-making factories has been secured after owner Stellantis announced it would make electric vans there. It's investing $1.4 million in Vauxhall's Ellesmere port, which, alongside government support, secures 1,000 jobs at the site. Citroën, Peugeot and Vauxhall commercial vans will be made there from the end of this year. Sainsbury's has increased its profit outlook after first quarter results beat expectations. The UK's second largest supermarket chain said sales, excluding fuel, grew 1.6% in these 16 weeks ending June. Analysts had forecast a fall. The group expects to generate a profit of $917 million this fiscal year, up from a previous projection of $861 million. You're watching CGTN. Still ahead, Germany welcomes double jabbed visitors, lifting a ban on travel designed to keep the Delta variant out. Search CGTN Europe wherever you get your podcasts to subscribe to The Agenda Podcast. The Agenda with me, Stephen Cole, always gets to the heart of the story. Just subscribe today and listen now. Covering the world from four continents, a new horizon. Teams in Beijing, Washington, D.C., Nairobi, and London. Who connect, interact, and inquire to bring you the stories that matter to all. The Link, only on CGTN. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. The world has changed under the pressure of the pandemic. For many of us, life is returning to some kind of normal. As we're adapting to changes in all of our lives, let Global Business Europe be your guide to the new normal. Join us weekdays on CGTN. Global Business Europe. And a quick reminder, CGTN is available to watch for free on all of the major digital platforms on Smart TV, online at Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV, YouTube and Dailymotion, CGTN.com and the CGTN app. The UK plans to further ease COVID restrictions next month on top of the easing that will come in July with self-isolation rules set to be lifted for anyone double-jabbed as well as under-18s. The Health Minister, Sajid Javid, admitted England will be entering uncharted territory and COVID infection numbers could easily rise above 100,000 a day. Well, our correspondent, Nicole Johnston, is at Westminster for us. So, Nicole, the UK now looks like something of a test case for the world, unlocking in the middle of rising infections. So why is the government doing this and how do people feel about it? That's right. What's happening right now is unprecedented. As you said, the British government is preparing to fully unlock the economy in the middle of the July 
in the middle of rising infections. Cases right now are doubling every nine days. It won't be long and it will reach 50,000 and then we're hearing it could easily get to 100,000. Now, the government's message is essentially it's now or never. If they don't unlock now in the middle of summer when things are a little bit easier, our children are on school holidays, then when will they do it? So they're forging ahead. Uh, the British government has also announced that when it comes to people who have received both doses of the vaccine, if they come into contact with somebody who's had COVID-19, from the middle of August, they'll no longer have to self-isolate for 10 days. However, it does sound as though they will be required to take a test. Let's have a listen to what the Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, has had to say about it. As we make this change, we'll be drawing on the huge capacity we've built for testing and sequencing and advising close contacts who are fully vaccinated to take a PCR test as soon as possible so they can get certainty about their condition. And of course, anyone that tests positive will have to self-isolate whether they have had the jab or not. Well, Nicole, let's focus on education for a moment because a lot of school days have been missed during the pandemic. So what do the changes mean for children, students and their education? Well, when it comes to that, the government has announced that children in bubbles at school, ordinarily what happens is if somebody in that bubble uh, has COVID-19, then the entire group will then have to go home and self-isolate for up to 10 days. That's been causing all sorts of problems. Last week, 375,000 students in England were at home self-isolating. Many students have had to do this a number of times. Obviously, the schools, the parents, the teachers are saying that it can't go on. And now the government agrees it's doing away with that policy uh, also from the middle of August. Nicole Johnston in Westminster, thanks for updating us. Well, as Nicole was uh, explaining there, wearing masks in England will become optional from the 19th of July. But many people are worried it's just a step too far too soon, particularly as cases start to rise. Professor Sean Griffiths co-chaired the SARS inquiry for the Hong Kong government in 2003. Mask wearing uh, started off quite slowly in England and there's always been a bit of resistance. However, uh, more recently, people have been wearing them quite willingly and I think that people won't give them up that willingly. Um, yesterday, the chief medical officer was clear that he would carry on uh, wearing his mask in certain situations and I expect we see that to be a far more widespread phenomenon. I'm sure that uh, many people will continue wearing them and, and perhaps uh, many people won't. I, I wonder, can relaxing this policy potentially contribute to a rise in future infections? Potentially it could because we know that uh, wearing a mask protects other people. If you have the virus, symptomatic or asymptomatic, it's protective. And uh, so if you're not wearing a mask, potentially it could uh, contribute to the rise in viruses but we're seeing a rise in virus spread anyway at the current time in the UK. Might the UK uh, adapt the habit of wearing masks the same way that people do in many countries in Asia? I would expect that to be the case. I spent uh, many years working in Hong Kong after the SARS epidemic. And there, people, if they had a upper respiratory tract infection, would wear a mask in, if they came into the office, if they felt well enough to go to work but didn't want to infect other people with their cold. They'd wear a mask. People would wear a mask uh, if you went into a hospital or a healthcare situation. And, and that was just something you expected to do. And then as soon as the pandemic started, there were great queues for mask, uh, to buy masks because people knew that masks are protective at a time when disease levels are high. So I expect we'll see something quite similar in the UK. Is this the right time to ease COVID restrictions in the UK? I think that's a tricky question, and it uh, is one that's obviously uh, about risk, and it's a decision made by the politicians. Uh, in a way, uh, you could take the view that some countries in the East are taking that you want to uh, contain COVID and have no cases. I think there's an acceptance that COVID is going to be endemic uh, in uh, Europe, in, in uh, many other countries. Uh, as such, uh, we need to learn to live with it and, uh, in a way, getting used to living with it in the summer when school children are on holiday, we're out in the open air, 
is possibly a good time to actually move into that learning to live with it. But I, I, th I think that we need to really stay very vigilant and we need to remember our own personal behaviors, you know, washing our hands, keeping, uh, you know, keeping a, a reasonable distance, keeping the windows open. All those things will help to protect because we still have very many vulnerable people in our community. It's very difficult to go backwards on these restrictions, though, isn't it? It's very difficult to throw open everything and then in a few months reverse it all. That's why vaccination is so important. Uh, we know that having two uh, vaccine, two shots of vaccine, highly protective against serious disease, against stress in the NHS, uh, and, and hopefully protective against death. So really, I think as long as people get vaccinated, when the booster system starts in the, in, uh, the autumn, people come forward for their boosters, all of that will help to protect against the disease because we are going to see an increasing number of cases as the restrictions are released. Hopefully, with vaccines in use, uh, people will not be seriously ill and we will be able to sort of reach that position. However, I think that if we start to see uh, certain hotspots, you will need to put into place the public health measures of uh, additional uh, surge contact tracing of isolation and of really doubling up on any people uh, to make sure that people who aren't vaccinated do receive the vaccine. Germany is relaxing entry for British tourists, opening up its borders to jab double jabbed travellers. Berlin has announced that five countries, including the UK, will be taken off the list for variant hotspots. Ryan Thompson reports from Frankfurt. Well, effective nearly immediately, Germany will ditch a strict ban on British arrivals flying directly to Germany just days after the Chancellor Angela Merkel met with British Prime Minister Boris Johnson in the United Kingdom. The bloc was put in place in May to stop the spread of the Delta variant of COVID-19, and passengers were subject to some pretty strict quarantine requirements. On top of that, officials were only allowing people to enter Germany if they had residency here. Now that all changes, double vaccinated UK travellers can enter without residency and without the requirement to quarantine. While the policy change is perhaps the most significant for the UK, which is mulling a return to European summer holidays, it also affects Portugal, Russia, India and Nepal, who were put in the same category of virus variant areas by Germany's disease control centre. Of course, the variant at the centre of this, the Delta variant, is becoming more and more common in Germany. Cases here remain low, averaging under 500 each day, but it's believed that nearly half of new infections are being caused by the Delta variant. Eleven countries will remain on Germany's list of virus variant areas, so they will be subject to those strict quarantine requirements and difficult entry conditions. But above all, this is welcomed news for airlines, British holidaymakers, and people with loved ones on both sides of the border who are hoping to reunite at some point this summer. Ryan Thompson, CGTN, Frankfurt. You're watching CGTN. Still ahead, footy. We're live at Wembley as Italy takes on Spain in the first Euro 2020 semi-finals. The EU's digital COVID certificate, which offers the promise of unlocking hassle-free travel around Europe this summer. In less than two weeks' time, the Czech border will also open to all EU and Serbian citizens. 4.4 million Hungarians received their first dose of COVID vaccine. 18 and over can receive a COVID-19 vaccination, but it does come with conditions. Third wave will probably take longer to emerge. This vaccination centre is part of a massive effort to try and drive down the numbers of the new variant that was first identified in India. On the agenda with me, Stephen Cole, we look up into space. We look down into data. We look at debt. We look at politics. We look at opioids, climate change. We look at all the issues that really matter around the world. But you matter too. We want to tell the stories you want to see and hear about. Make it your agenda.
We can try out the wild and crazy idea. Nothing can stop an idea whose time is coming. This idea is coming. I actually feel quite comfortable in isolation. We should all be very basic when we try to save the world. We hope it will happen. We have to live in hope. The agreement is signed. But what is the real deal now the UK has left the EU? For trade, for business, for the city, for ordinary people. Make sense of Brexit with CGTN. back to Global Business Europe with Jamie Owen and Robin Dwyer. Our top stories, political leaders from across the world join China's President Xi Jinping as he marks a century of the country's governing party. Britain's biggest microchip factory is sold to the Chinese company Nexperia despite security concerns. And shares in the ride-hailing app Didi slump on US markets as Chinese regulators crack down on big tech. The new EU president's message was more warning than welcome. Yanis Jansha accused the EU of trying to impose imaginary European values on Central Europe, saying it risks causing the entire union to collapse. The Slovenian prime minister is a vocal Trump supporter and an ally of Hungary's Viktor Orban, who clashed with Brussels over an anti-gay law. Well, our correspondent Tony Waterman is in the Belgian capital. So, Tony, a combative start to Jansha's six-month term. Yes, yeah, certainly, Robin. We're just six days in to Slovenia taking the reins of this rotating presidency, and it has been anything but smooth sailing. The prime minister, uh, Jansa, tried today to hit what would normally be all of the right notes when he addressed the European Parliament in Strasbourg for the first time in this new position. He said that his top priority is going to be getting the bloc out of this pandemic, ensuring that it recovers, increasing vaccination. He said that there needs to be a high level of protection for human rights, including a freedom of expression. He also said that judicial systems need to be independent impartial and indiscriminate. But EU lawmakers were really not buying any of it. They said that his actions have reflected very little of those uh, priorities. He came back into power in March of 2020 for his third stint uh, in power at the helm of Slovenia. And since then, there has been a lot of tension uh, with Brussels. He's been accused of muzzling the media. He has been uh, repeatedly criticizing journalists and organizations on Twitter. He slashed public funding for Slovenia's national news agency. He called it a national uh, disgrace. He's also been accused of undermining the judicial system, uh, also criticizing judges. But also we heard from uh, prosecutors from Slovenia earlier this year saying that there is uh, inadmissible pressures being uh, placed on the judicial system there. The big claim overall is that uh, Slovenia right now under his leadership is backsliding on democracy and there is a complete disregard for the rule of law. He, of course, defended himself in Parliament today and also at a press conference afterwards, but he said that, in his opinion, there are just more important things to be talking about. Take a listen. Without the rule of law, there is no European Union. This is perfectly clear. I myself signed the Lisbon Treaty. I know what it says, and I fully support the rule of law today as I did then. But there are other problems. For example, in Belarus, there are 400 political prisoners who are dying. They also deserve our support. There are many other problems which are immeasurably more relevant than the one we are now wasting time on. So, Tony, now that he is at the helm, how could he influence the EU's agenda? 
Well, the EU rotating presidency is a symbolic role. It's a bureaucratic role. Uh, Prime Minister Jansa is not going to be, you know, making the decision on EU policy or dictating new laws, nothing like that. But Slovenia is going to be responsible for coordinating the council working groups, also working with the parliament and the European Commission on passing new laws. And for Prime Minister Jansa himself, he is going to be present uh, at a lot of media events, at a lot of press conferences. He announced today that he is going to host two summits on enlargement for West Balkan uh, countries. He's also going to be front and center at a lot of these high-level press conferences that we're going to see over the next six months alongside the commission president Ursula von der Leyen and the council president Charles Michel. So while he's not going to be perhaps that influential when it comes to what is decided overall over the next six months, he is certainly going to have a platform and a very large megaphone to get his message and his priorities uh, across. Tony Waterman in Brussels. Thank you. The devil is in the detail, and there are many, many details that need to be ironed out for Britain's separation deal with the European Union to work. That was the upshot of a press conference hosted by the new EU ambassador to the UK, who said he hopes to see cooler heads prevail in future negotiations. Andrew Wilson reports. Brexit is a living animal. That was the conclusion by the EU ambassador to the UK at Tuesday's conference, and it pretty much sums up the long-term challenge of a separation process that may have been signed, but delegates agreed had a minefield of detail left in it. Topping the list of concerns was, not surprisingly, the Northern Ireland Protocol. It's already creating difficulties with Westminster-Brussels relations, and there are few solutions on offer. One former UK negotiator said he was not optimistic for the near future, predicting that grudging acceptance might be a best-case scenario. The thorny subject of Scottish independence was raised. Uh, the broader view is that it's a strong possibility down the line, but delegates were equally sure that there would be few special favours around for an independent Scotland looking for EU membership, particularly where a UK-Scotland land border was concerned. It's clear both sides have a way to go in reforming fixed positions fostered during the five difficult years since the original Brexit vote in 2016. The UK may be celebrating its newly won sovereignty, but Brussels, as head of a 27-nation bloc, is unlikely ever to regard it as an economic equal. The EU ambassador said it was his job to encourage a more serene atmosphere to future discussions with less drama. We are neighbours, after all, said João Valle de Almeida. The stage is set now for difficult debates on issues such as data, regulatory sovereignty, trade tariffs and the rest between two one-time partners who still share the same geography, are still allies and still have common strategic and economic interests. Andrew Wilson, CGTN. Tropical storm Elsa is lashing the Florida Keys and threatens to strengthen as it heads towards the US mainland. A hurricane watch is in place for Florida's Gulf Coast as 95 kilometer per hour winds batter the area. The storm has already dumped heavy rain over Cuba, where 180,000 people have been moved from flood prone areas or unsafe housing. At least three people in the Caribbean have died in the storm. Rescue crews are still searching for survivors after torrential rain caused landslides in Japan at the weekend. Four people are known to have died and dozens of buildings have been destroyed after mud engulfed houses in the city of Tami, 90 kilometers south of Tokyo. Around 24 people are still unaccounted for. Gunmen in Nigeria's Kaduna state have abducted at least 140 students from a school. It's believed the gunmen attacked Bethel Baptist High School in the early hours of Monday and overpowered security there. The attack is the fourth mass school kidnapping in the state since December. Russian media says there are no survivors from the passenger plane crash in the east of the country. Russia's Civil Aviation Authority says it has located the crash site. Officials say 28 passengers were on board. The plane had reportedly been in service since 1982. The former Belarus presidential contender who had hopes to run against leader Alexander Lukashenko in last summer's election has been jailed by a Minsk court. Victor Babariko is facing 14 years in prison after being found guilty of money laundering, bribery and tax evasion. He was arrested in June last year after attending electoral offices to register as a candidate. 
The U.S. Embassy in Belarus called the case against him a cruel sham. Israel's new parliament has suffered its first major setback. The eight-party coalition has failed to renew a law that bars citizenship or residency to Palestinians from Gaza and the West Bank who were married to Israeli nationals. Despite all-night talks, not enough votes were raised to extend the controversial law. A vote of no confidence in the new government also failed. Football now, and the first of the Euro 2020 semi-finals takes place later as Italy plays Spain at Wembley Stadium in London. The tournament has been held in the shadow of the pandemic, so fewer fans have been allowed to travel to watch the games live. CGTN's Rahul Pathak looks at the economic penalty. Football tournaments like the Euros usually mean party time for fans and a financial windfall for anyone connected to the event. From organisers and merchandisers to the hospitality industry, it's thought the previous tournament held in France in 2016 generated around $1.48 billion for the French economy. However, these Euros are very, very different. Firstly, there is no single host. Spain is one of 11 different countries being used to host this particular tournament, meaning any potential financial dividend is diluted. What's more, this tournament is taking place in the middle of a pandemic, meaning the movement of fans and the amount allowed to watch the games live in the stadium is severely restricted. Crucially, though, European football's governing body UEFA insisted that some fans be allowed into stadiums. And that was good news for the 11 cities able to host the tournament. Earlier this year, a report by analytics company Global Data estimated that London alone could have potentially lost out on $354 million in revenue if games at Wembley were played behind closed doors. However, the economic boost from Euro 2020 will still be significantly less than previous tournaments, both in terms of fans at the stadium and those watching at home. It is very likely that you are following the game uh, from, um, from uh, you know, do, uh, through TV and then you see an empty stadium, the impact that the event will have on you if you are not emotionally involved in the game, but you're watching it as a general spectator, the impact might be significant with respect to uh, seeing not the right atmosphere of the game. But while these Euros may not generate the amount of money as in previous tournaments, the economic boost they've provided will have given some respite to the industry's worst hit by the pandemic. People are so enthusiastic about football that they just forgot about coronavirus and like be in the football game so enthusiastic and excited, but it's like a disconnect from reality. Because of football, we have noticed more people coming into the bar, and that has had a positive impact on the business. Whichever team ends up lifting the European Championship trophy on Sunday, it's already clear that UEFA will be the big winner. Commercial and TV deals saw it make over a billion dollars at the last Euros, and this may explain its eagerness to hold a postponed tournament this year, pandemic or no pandemic. Mahal Pathak, CGTN, Madrid. And that semi-final featuring Italy and Spain kicks off in just a few hours from now. Our correspondent Guy Henderson is at Wembley for us. Uh, Guy, set the scene. How's the build-up ahead of tonight's big match? Well, it's a pretty, pretty um, interesting atmosphere, Jamie. Nothing like the England games we've seen so far. Um, Italy versus Spain, the seventh time they've in the knockout stages of a European Championship competition, these two. Uh, the last encounter was in the 2016 Group of 16 match. Italy won that one. Uh, 2012, the one before that, the final. Uh, on that occasion, Spain thumped Italy 4-0. Uh, so, uh, you know, victories through the history of these fixtures uh, from both teams, both of them obviously in the past giants of world football. Um, on current form, I suppose you would probably favour Italy. Uh, they've been unbeaten for almost three years now. They knocked out Belgium, which of course is the world's number one uh, ranked side to reach this semi-final stage. But don't write off Spain. They've got plenty of world-class talent of their own. Um, and, you know, they might have left it late in their previous two knockout matches. Uh, but they did, in the end, get through stubborn performance, leaving it late. So, potential there for, for, for a surprise, perhaps. I think the really notable thing about this fixture is just looking at the crowds that are here. Yes, you have uh, Italian flags. Yes, you have... Um,
A lot of neutral supporters walking down this avenue towards Wembley Stadium behind me and the reason for that is that the would-be travelling fans from both of those countries have not been allowed to travel for Wem to Wembley um, for this fixture in the UK due to travel restrictions uh, during the pandemic. So it's going to be interesting to see what what bearing those neutral fans might have on the game. Many of them, of course, will be English and they will be hoping uh, that one of these two teams uh, will be there, uh, the Eng England's opponent in the final. England, of course, have to play their semi-final first against Denmark here uh, on Wednesday. So where will those neutral fans uh, position the match and what bearing could that have on the game? We'll have to wait and see. Guy, I know it's a rude word to mention amongst football fans, but a lot of key cricket matches are being played at the moment. Host nation England has reported an outbreak of COVID cases. What more can you tell us about that? Yeah, so, you know, there's a, there's a one-day international series plan between uh, England and Pakistan, and now the England camp have confirmed seven cases of coronavirus. So, uh, even close contact to those positive cases are, are going to have to self-isolate, and that means that at, very, at the very last minute, the England camp are now having to assemble a completely new squad for that uh, one-day series. Look, you know, that's the risk you take in the world of international sport during a, a pandemic. It has had an impact, these kind of restrictions on different sporting events um, through the course of this uh, you know, global pandemic, including here at the European Championships. Um, England had two key players missing because they'd, have to, they'd, have to, they'd had to self-isolate uh, in the build-up to that knockout game against Germany, which England then went on to win. Um, the, the irony of, of all of this, of course, is that uh, the UK's new health minister has just announced changes to those self-isolation rules which will mean that after the 16th of august people who come into close contact with positive cases won't have to self-isolate but that won't be much comfort to this english cricket side they've now had to come up with a whole new squad to face pakistan guy enjoy the football thanks for that guy henderson there live for us at wembley you're watching cgtn still ahead Back at the movies, the Cannes Film Festival returns after the pandemic postponement. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities, wherever you look. We are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. What would you say is a good question? Stephen, I'd say it's one where there's always more than one answer. The Answers Project is a new podcast series from CGTN Europe. With me, Stephen Cole. And me, Mari Beveridge. In each episode, we'll take a complex question. And with the help of some of the world's foremost experts, shine light on some of the answers. So join us for The Answers Project. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, welcome back to Global Business Europe. France's champagne industry has been left somewhat shaken after the Kremlin ruled that only wine produced in Russia can be sold as champagne. The law approved by President Putin means that French producers will now have to rename their product sparkling wine if they want to sell in Russia. Well, let's talk to the wine expert and writer, Robert Joseph. Robert, uh, why did President Putin come up with this new champagne law now? 
Well, it's a very good question. I think there's a lot going on. There's a lot of friction between Europe and Russia right now. Um, there's a lot to do with Crimea, because Crimea is one of the histor historical places where sparkling wine and what the Russians used to call, uh, and still do like to call, Champanskoye uh, was made. And this is a now reviving industry within Crimea, which obviously um, uh, the Russians consider part of their country and uh, Ukraine considers part of Ukraine. So this is a, it's obviously a very much a political pawn and champagne is uh, for the French nation and indeed for the world, I guess, an icon. So it's, it's something that's very easy for um, President Putin to use uh, as, as a hammer to bash at France with. Can you give us a steer on how this will affect the domestic industries in both France and Russia? Well, um, Russia is not the biggest buyer of, um, of champagne. I think the figure I last saw was they drink about a 15th as much as the U.S., for example. Um, if you are out and about in Moscow at night, you definitely do see some very good, very expensive bottles of champagne in some of the clubs there going off with, with um, indoor fireworks and so on. So uh, it's going to be an issue. I'm not sure, to be honest, that it's going to affect brands like Merton Chandon and Krug and Cristal, those top brands of champagne, because I'm sure people don't need to know their champagne. What I think is going to be an issue is all of those small producers who do need the word champagne on the front of their label, because otherwise people just think they're a sparkling wine. Now, what the Russian rules are, is, are that these wines will now be called sparkling wine, and only a Russian, a Russian sparkling wine will be able to be called uh, champagne square. So um, I think potentially it's going to hit those wines. And one estimate I saw is that as many as 20,000 labels, individual wines might be affected by these kinds of moves. Actually, just to say, this is only starting with champagne, but from what I've been hearing from my sources in, in Russia, other wines may be affected by similar moves in the months uh, to come. It's part of a sort of shakeup within the Russian wine industry um, to try and boost um, sales and market for that industry, which I have to say um, has a number of President Putin's friends involved in it. Well, corkscrews have been drawn at dawn. Uh, I wonder how will the French and the EU respond? Well, I'm not sure about the EU. France is interesting because you've got two separate responses, uh, maybe three when the French government gets involved, but I'm not aware of that having happened yet. On the one hand, you've got the big companies, LVMH, the luxury goods company, which owns Verve Clicquot, Merton Chandon, Krug, um, who have gone through two or three phases here saying they wouldn't and comply with the rules and then saying they would. But you've also got a body called the CIBC, which is basically represents all of the producers in Champagne. And they actually raised an edict saying that no wine should be shipped, no champagne should be sold uh, to Russia. So potentially a little bit of a standoff there. I suspect that if anybody needs to get champagne into Russia, it will happen one way or the other anyway. But I think this is like, I think what's interesting at the moment is that wine in general has been a pawn in a number of battles. So we've seen it with um, uh, President Trump putting very high um, tariffs on European wines. And we've obviously seen that um, with the relationship between China and Australia recently. So there's quite a lot of issues where wine is being seen as something that, that brings people to negotiating tables. Russia has uh, a long established wine industry uh, of its own, as you said earlier, although I guess that was perhaps less well known than France's industry. Um, yes, I mean, I'm um, obviously here in the UK, we have a burgeoning um, English sparkling wine industry, and there's a certain amount of, of local pride in drinking English wine. In Russia, the same thing applies. I've been going to Russia for 20 or 30 years. And when I first went there, you never saw Russian wine. Now, suddenly, Russian wine is something you see in a lot of restaurants, a lot of clubs, and it, you know, it is being taken seriously. And there's some very decent Russian wine being made. Well, there has to be said that some of the Russian wine, including some of the sparkling wine I've seen, may well include um, juice from outside Russia. <laughs> Robert, good to talk to you. Cheers, as we should say, I guess. Uh, thank you very much thank indeed for coming much. on the programme. Uh, Robert Joseph. The Cannes Film Festival is underway in the south of France after last year's was postponed in the pandemic. The festival will be an in-person event and promotes traditional cinema at a time when lockdowns have given streaming services a big boost. 
Ross Cullen went to the movies. Well, the glitz and glamour of the Cannes Film Festival is back with the 74th festival getting underway on Tuesday. It's one of the most famous stops on the world cinema circuit, returning this year with a bumper edition of extra films. There are screenings and movies from directors from across the world, from Argentina and Israel to Greece and China. The first movie to be shown on Tuesday is Annette, which stars French actor Marion Cotillard. Cannes is a festival que j'adore. Cannes is a festival I love. I've been coming every year for about a decade, and now life is starting to open back up. Cultural life, the life of the cinema, and with a film at the Cannes Festival, it's a great joy. For the community on the French Mediterranean coast, a major week-long event like the festival will bring a much-needed economic boost as hotels and restaurants welcome the thousands of guests and workers who will be attending. We are expecting a real rebirth after the difficult period we went through. Last year we had a season without a festival, so for us it is truly a bright spell for the economy and for the city. Domestic coronavirus restrictions have been lifted in France, so the stars will be able to dine at luxury restaurants and stay out late at those glamorous parties, though it is still obligatory to wear a face mask inside in public. Some international travel restrictions are still in place, meaning French visitors are set to outnumber those high-spending foreigners. Now, aside from the movies, the organisers are hoping to show that they are modernising when it comes to how green the festival plans to be. Every person attending will have to pay 20 euros to offset their travel costs to the southern French coast. The red carpets are going to be made of recycled material. No plastic water bottles will be used and every caterer must offer a vegetarian meal option. Ross Cullen, CGTN, Paris. Now, he may be best known for his sculptures of dead cows and sharks, but British artist Damien Hirst's latest exhibition has opened in Paris, and his new work shows a much gentler tone. The former bad boy of art has produced a dozen new oil paintings of cherry blossoms in full bloom, saying working alone in lockdown has forced him to concentrate on the positive side of life. To see them, visit europe.cgtn.com. And finally, after five years of construction, one of the world's biggest astronomy museums is preparing to open in Shanghai. The building has been designed to look like two planetary orbits. Some visitors got a sneak peek on Monday ahead of the official opening on the 18th of July. The collection includes 70 meteorites, including from the Moon, Mars and the giant asteroid Vesta. There are also original works from some of the most celebrated astronomers in history, including Galileo and Johannes Kepler, and also on show the first edition copy of Isaac Newton's famous text, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, first published in 1729. The museum says it will be able to hold around 6,000 visitors per day. The headlines again. Political leaders from across the world have joined China's President Xi Jinping as he marks a century of the country's governing party. Britain's biggest microchip factory is sold to the Chinese-owned company Nexperia, despite security concerns. And shares in the ride-hailing app Didi slump on U.S. markets as Chinese regulators crack down on big tech. Well, that's it for Global Business Europe. Thanks for watching. More on all of our stories at europe.cgtn.com and do follow CGTN Europe on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. We're on smart TV apps such as Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV. YouTube and Daily Motion, cgtn.com and the CGTN app. Coming up next on CGTN, it's Africa Live. We'll see you again tomorrow, same time, same place. From all of the team in London, it's goodbye. Goodbye.